Good morning and welcome to our virtual worship today. A couple of announcements that we would like to share with you before we begin. First of all, uh, we want to continue to remember all of those who are on our prayer request list. Uh, especially at this time, we want to remember uh, Joby and Clifford Dean Eakes. Also, uh, we have our first potential case of coronavirus that is in some way linked to our church. I received word last week from Gail Dye that uh, J.D. and Gail's daughter-in-law, Brittany, uh, had a doctor's appointment, a tele-doctor's appointment, and the doctor has suggested that she has coronavirus. Uh, I think that this is probably, and the Dye family thinks that it's probably a overreaction on the doctor's part. Her only symptoms are a fever and fatigue. She doesn't have the telltale cough. But nonetheless, uh, we certainly want to be prayerful for uh, Brittany and that family as well. On a positive note, we rejoice with the Brewer family upon Clay Brewer's decision uh, to put the Lord on in baptism this past Sunday here at the building. So we uh, rejoice with the angels of heaven with his decision. I hope all of you are having a great week and hope that you will join us as we worship God together this morning. Good morning. First song today is going to be A Wonderful Savior. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transport our eyes to me, in clouds of the sky, his perfect salvation is wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Before the Lord's Supper this morning, we will sing, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's fountain. In the cross, in the cross, be Love and mercy. 
of self-reflection. It's a time that we, we look and, and we're really uh, convicted of the things that we've, that we've done. It's easy to see the, the people that were around the base of the cross, they were, they were chastising our Savior and saying, if you're really the Son of God, come down off that cross. You know, He could have done so, so easily. But instead, he, he chose to, to stay there and to finish the, the task that he had of offering salvation to each, each and every one of us. We're no less guilty than the people who were standing there and, and teasing and taunting him. We do the same type of thing when we, whenever we choose to engage in sin. So this morning, as we, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's, let's think of the, of the wonderful gift that Jesus has given us and the, the sacrifice that he, that he made so that we may have hope for eternal life. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the bread which represents the body that was shed on the cross for our sins. Father, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to pay that price that must have, that must have been paid in order for us to enjoy living with you in heaven. Father, help us to partake at this time and do so in a manner that would be well-pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name. Let's also give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the cup of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Christ shed on the cross for the mission of our sins. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we partake of it at this time, that we may do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. It's also very appropriate that we take this opportunity to give thanks for the blessings that we have. Um, if you have, have the ability to um, to take your offering over to the to the building, there's a there's a place to put the put that offering. But we are a, a very blessed people, and we need to to take time and reflect on that and acknowledge that this morning. Let's give thanks for our blessings. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for everything that you do for us. There are so many things that we take for granted that happen each and every day that, that you do that, that takes care of us in such a wonderful way. Father, we ask that you would be with us as we have an opportunity to give back a portion of the things that you have blessed us with so that your name can be glorified in this community and throughout the world. Father, help us to always be thankful for the, gift that, the gifts that you give, the, the safety that you provide, the healing that you provide, and Father, most of all, the salvation that you provided. Father, we're most of all thankful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Next song this morning is going to be Wonderful Word of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of thy beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life.
us this morning. We will sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to Who seek after God. 
They have all turned aside together and become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Word of God says that atheists are fools. The atheist says there is no one who I am accountable to. There is no one who I am answerable to. Being this way, giving no thought to God whatsoever, is to live and results in living a corrupt life. In Proverbs 10, verse 23, we read this, A fool finds pleasure in evil conduct. So, fools are antagonistic towards God. They mock God. Your translation may say revile. That simply means to insult, to scorn, to despise. These individuals have a hatred towards God. People mock God because of their hatred of Him. Others mock God because they don't take Him seriously. In Psalm 74, verse 18, we read this, Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has reviled and foolish people have scorned Your name. Then in verse 22, we read, Arise, O God, and plead Your case. Remember how a foolish man reproaches You all day long. And so the fool mocks God. But we must be careful about mocking God. Uh, Tancredo Neves was running for president in Brazil. During the campaign, he stated that if he gained 500,000 votes from his party, not even God Himself would remove him from the presidency. He got those 500,000 votes. But he got sick the day before his inauguration and died, having never taken office. An unknown White Star Line employee at the time of the Titanic's launch in May 31st of 1911 said, not even God Himself can sink this ship. In Brazil, a group of friends, drunk, went to pick up another one of their friends. The mother accompanied this individual, her child, to the car and pleaded with her not to go with her intoxicated friends. She pleaded with her daughter, holding her hand as she was already in the car, and even though she was unable to persuade her daughter not to go, as she left, the mother said, My daughter, go with God, and He may protect you. She responded, Only if He travels in the trunk, because in here, it's already full. Hours later came the news that there had been a fatal accident. Everyone in the car had perished. As... They were going through the wreckage. Something strange caught the attention of the police officers. The trunk was undamaged. And to their surprise, when they opened the trunk, they found a crate of eggs, not a single one of them broken. On April 12th, Easter Sunday, storms ripped through the southeast. One image that made the news was a picture of some of the storm's aftermath in which it knocked over trees and buildings and at the Lawyer Baptist Church off of Highway 78 in Dora, Alabama, they had three crosses that had been standing for a long time in the church lawn. The two side crosses had fallen. The center cross remained standing. Brothers and sisters, it is a dangerous thing to mock God. Fools are antagonistic towards God. Not only are they antagonistic towards God, uh, but they are prideful. Uh, fools are prideful. And when we are prideful towards God, that is going to result in a number of different attitudes that we have. In Proverbs 10 verse 8, we read, The wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. And so a fool is prideful. 
In our pride, we will not accept commands. You're not going to tell me what to do is the mantra of a fool. He will not accept being told what to do. The fool is going to reject authority. A fool despises structure. A fool despises boundaries. In our pride, always wanting to do things our way, we will be frustrated because in every aspect of our lives, there are areas of order and there are areas of submission to some kind of authority. And when I refuse to submit to that authority, I am going to be frustrated with my life. And, and so the fool is prideful. Uh, he will not submit to authority. The fool always thinks that he is right. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. In our pride, we oftentimes will not be open to receiving advice because we already think that we know everything. In our pride, we will not learn a better way to do something or a safer way to do something or a more intelligent way to do something because we already think that we have all the answers. A fool will not accept rebuke. Proverbs 17 verse 10. A rebuke goes deeper into one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. In our pride, we may not be open to input and correction. I will not accept you calling me into account. I will not accept responsibility for my own wrongdoing. Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool rejects correction, he rejects discipline. Instead of being humbled and accepting that disciplinary action, the fool rejects it, which is foolish, because in our rejection of correction, we set the stage to be repeat offenders causing greater and greater consequences in our lives. Another way in which a fool is prideful in that he doesn't learn from his mistakes. In Proverbs 26 verse 11, the Word of God says, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats folly. John Wayne is quoted as saying, life is hard, it's harder when you're stupid. Uh, life is going to be harder when we do not learn from our mistakes. Life will be harder when we are prideful and don't want to learn a better way. Life is going to be harder when we are stubborn and want to keep doing things a certain way, even when there is a better way, smarter way to do it. And we are going to live our lives in frustration when we choose to live the life of a fool. Now, let me say there's a difference between acting foolishly and being a fool. We all at some time in our lives are going to do something foolish and hopefully we are wise enough to be able to look at ourselves and say, self, that was foolish and learn from that and not do it again. That's called learning from our mistakes, but the fool will persist in his folly. They will not learn from their mistakes. As the proverb writer says, uh, the fool will purposefully return to his own vomit, not learning from our mistakes, making our lives increasingly painfully hard. Another way in which a fool is, uh, or how we can spot a fool, is that a fool is easily angered. It doesn't take much to set off a fool. A foolish person is easily annoyed, and instead of squashing it, they quickly snap. Instead of overlooking it, a fool will display his lack of self-control. Proverbs 12, verse 16, A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. Fools have hot tempers and do foolish things without thought of consequence. A fool in his anger is reactionary instead of controlled. In our anger, our actions are reckless and they are done instinctively without any regards to the aftermath of it. And that's how a fool will oftentimes end up in jail. Proverbs 14, verse 16, A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. A fool looks for a fight. 
Now, it's one thing to be provoked to anger, but it's another thing looking for opportunities to display that anger. It's as if the fool actually enjoys being angry. Keeping away from strife is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel, the proverb writer tells us. And so the fool is out of control. There's no restraints on him whatsoever. All bets are off. There is no walking away. There's no filter on his mouth. There's no thinking things through. There is no self-control. When a fool gets angry, there's no stopping until the destruction is complete. Proverbs 29.11 A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. A fourth way to spot a fool is that a fool is recognized by his mouth. A fool runs his mouth and gets himself into trouble. A fool doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. He keeps antagonizing a situation. He provokes people to anger. He pushes people to the limit. In Proverbs 18, verse 6, we read this, A fool's lips bring strife, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. A fool is recognized by the foolishness of his speech. We've all heard the adage, it's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. The proverb writer said it this way, The tongue of the wise man makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. A fool isn't spending his time learning and growing. No, a fool isn't trying to be discerning. Instead, he runs off at the mouth. He feeds and lives off of foolish talk, gossip, lies, slander, senseless discussions, and the like. A fool's mouth gush gushes foolish, hurtful, and harmful speech. Proverbs 15 verse 14 says this, The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. And then the last thing that we see as to how we can recognize a fool is that a fool is irresponsible. A fool has no sense of wise money management, nor does he want any. A fool doesn't plan ahead. A fool doesn't have a budget. A fool doesn't pay his bills first. A fool spends money foolishly. In Proverbs 17, verse 6, we read, Why is there a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom when he has no sense. In Ecclesiastes 4 verse 5, we read, The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. A fool is lazy. He doesn't want to do anything productive. He doesn't want to better himself. He doesn't want to improve his situation or the situation of others. And he doesn't understand that he is going to be ruined by his folly. Proverbs 24, verse 30, I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles, its surface was covered, and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected on it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come over you like a robber and your want like an armed man. A foolish life will be ruined by his laziness. In Luke 12, beginning in verse 14, we read the story of the rich fool. A famous millionaire died of cancer. For weeks he suffered in, in intolerable agony. Although he was surrounded by every luxury that his money could buy, he died as wretchedly as a pauper. There was the usual publicity, there were the flowers, there was the telephone calls, the telegrams. There was the expensive bronze casket and the towering, beautifully carved tombstone. After the funeral, a relative looked to another and said, How much do you suppose Harry left? The reply came back, he left everything he had. Yes, Harry could... Not take a single thing with him. He worked harder than a slave would have. He grasped, he saved, he cheated, he lied. And where legally possible, he stole and amassed great fortunes. He lived for himself, but he left all that he had. He faced God without hope or plea. Harry was a poor fool. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from wealth. 
All right, let's conclude this morning by discussing how not to become a fool. Uh, the first thing is don't hang around fools. Pretty simple. Proverbs 13, verse 20, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. If I hang around those who are wise, a little wisdom is going to rub off on me. If I hang around with fools, I will be negatively influenced into foolish behavior. Proverbs 14, verse 7, Leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern words of knowledge. We should listen to the counsel of fools. We should, be take, we should rather be taking advice from godly people. Number two, don't entertain foolish arguments. I remember my father used to say, never wrestle with a pig, it only gets you muddy and the pig loves it. And that's what happens when you are arguing with a fool. Uh, you are lowering yourself to that level and the fool loves it. Proverbs 26 verse 4, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you will be like him. If I allow myself to get caught up in foolish debates, then there will be two fools talking. 2 Timothy 2 verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Entertaining foolish arguments produces nothing good. If you don't want to be a fool, number three, don't trust your own perspective. Proverbs 28 26, he who trusts in his heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. I only trust myself. I, I'm not going to trust anyone else. I'm only going to trust myself. Proverbs 28, 26 says you're a fool. Instead of leaning on our own wisdom, trusting in our own knowledge, we need to lean on the wisdom of the Lord, trust in the Lord. And when we make decisions based on how we feel or how we perceive things to be, then the Word of God tells us we are a fool who is leaning on our own perspective, our own knowledge, our own understanding. Number four, build wisely. In Matthew 7, verses 24 and following, Jesus has just finished His great sermon on the mount. He taught so many important things. And one of the things that He asks is, why do you call Me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say or what I am telling you to do? Here in Matthew 7, Jesus tells us to build on a firm foundation. In 1174, the Italian architect Bonanno uh, Pisano began work on what would become his most famous project. The only problem with the project is that just after they began construction, they realized that the soil was softer than they had anticipated it being. And so during the process of the building, this man's most famous work of art began to lean. You and I know it today as the eight-story bell tower in the city of Pisa. The leaning tower. The foundation was too shallow to adequately hold the structure. And many times we build our lives in the same way. Our foundation, our faith foundation is too shallow. It took 176 years to build the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And they have tried to com compensate for the tilt throughout the years. Jesus tells us, He who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a man who builds his house on the sand. In Proverbs 14, verse 1, the Word of God says, The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears it down. And then finally, if we don't want to be a fool, we need to keep watch and be prepared. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the ten maidens who had their lamps preparing for the bridal party. Some were foolish and did not bring extra oil for the lamps. Others were wise and did. And in this parable, we learn the importance of not only keeping watch, but also being prepared. There is a legend that speaks of an oriental king whose servant was also his personal friend and favorite. One day, the king presented the servant with a gift. It was a golden bell. And he said, to his servant, if you ever find a greater fool than yourself, give this bell to that person. Well, the years had passed. 
and his master, the king, was now laying on his deathbed. The king called for his servant, and he told his servant in typical Eastern thought that he is about to go on a long journey and that he was ill-prepared for that journey. The servant asked his master, is it an unexpected journey? And the master said, no, on the contrary, I have been warned about, these, about this for many years, but I have been so engrossed with the cares of government, I have been so engrossed in the pleasures of this world, that I had given little thought or attention to the matter. And with that, the servant took the golden bell and handed it to the king. So this morning, don't think that you have plenty of time. Don't think that it is safe to continue to reject the gospel. Don't think that it is acceptable to be found sleeping. Don't be found without oil in your lamp. In a word, don't be a fool. Jim Elliott, the missionary who went to a tribe of headhunting uh, individuals who were known for killing all outsiders, people warned him not to go, that they would kill him. And they did, in fact, do just that. But before departing, he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Elliot's widow went back and evangelized that same tribe, and they are now a Christian tribe. And so, this morning, don't be a fool. Focus on what's most important. But above all, don't put off obeying the Lord. I hope you all have a great week. Look forward to seeing you again soon. In heavenly armor, we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory.
Lord, please be with us as we're going through this tough time. Let it get better so we can all meet again here. 